Good evening. Good to see everyone out this evening. Get my my cheaters out here. I'll tell you what, you get older, your eyes go, your hair goes. I'm glad for winter though, because your winter coat comes in, you know. And uh, I was counting the other day, and I think I was two up. But then I thought about it. I thought about it again. I thought I miscounted. So. You think you could get it long enough to do a, do a comb over or something? Well, I, I've, heard, I've heard wise people say, I'm not getting older, I'm just getting closer to home. Amen? That's what we're doing, folks. We're just getting closer to home. Brother Eddie McLeod, would you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. Talking about getting older, there's a song in here, page 213, the All-American Church Hymnal, where we'll never grow old. I have heard of a land on the far away strand is a beautiful home of the soul built by Jesus on high where we never shall die tis a land where we'll never grow never Folks, something to look forward to. Amen. Page number 72. Let's do the first, second, the last verse. My Savior's love. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love sinner condemned unclean oh how marvelous oh how wonderful and my song shall ever be oh how marvelous oh how wonderful is my savior's love for me 
Somebody singing tonight? Um, Caleb Wilson, the 19th, and you sing it for us. Caleb. Sure, I'm glad I forgot my guitar here. I kind of like being surprised. I was told I was supposed to sing tonight, but I tend to forget things. Um, Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and I shall see him at the last day. And if we have one hope, it is our Redeemer and that we will see him. But right now we joy through tribulation and suffering knowing that he is there mediating on our behalf. Seems like all I could see was a struggle The way I lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my failure Wondering how long is this gonna last Then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight. It's already been won. I am redeemed. You made me free. You broke off my heavy chain. I'm not who I used to be I've been redeemed Thank God redeemed All my life I have been so unworthy By the voice of my shame and regret But when I hear you whisper Child, lift up your head I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet I am redeemed Wiped away every 
stay Now I'm not who I used to be And I don't have to be the old man inside of me His day is long dead and gone I've got a new name, a new life I'm not the same And a hope that will carry me home I've been redeemed You made me free You broke off my heavy chains Wiped away every stain Now I'm not who I used to be I've been redeemed Good, brother. Redeemed. Hallelujah. He bought me back, didn't he? Did he buy you back? And when he found me, he bought me back from where he found me. He said, when I passed by thee, talking about a baby that was left in the desert, and he passed by us and he said, live, and we did. Well, it's good to be here, folks. We're going to continue with the book of 1 John. If you'd like to have, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 John chapter number 1. And verse number 8 with me tonight, please. 1 John chapter 1 and verse number 8. First John 1 John 1.8, the scripture says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Bless this book now, Father, your word. In thy name I pray, amen. If you notice how simple it is to get right with God, it has to do simply with a confession. Hamalagia is the Greek word. It's simply a big word, hamalas and lagia. It's a conjunction of the two words. Lagia's word, hamalas means of the same word. So that means that you agree with God and you agree with the, with the Holy Spirit. You're in agreement. You're not in rebellion. You're not running from God. You're in agreement with him. And by doing that, you're walking in fellowship. What you're doing is you're allowing the Holy Spirit to examine you better than you could ever examine yourself. Is that not the truth? Don't you think that the Holy Spirit can see into my soul better than I can see into my soul? Amen. And you need to understand, too, that he has a pattern and a purpose in everything that he does for us. Uh, he doesn't lead us immediately into a dogfight. He takes them around, he said to the children of Israel. He could have taken them clear into the land in no time, but he didn't do it. He allowed them to prepare themselves, and so it is with us. He shows us bits and pieces of what needs to be done to walk in fellowship. So we're talking about fellowship. In 1 John chapter number 1 and verse number 10, he said, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. If you notice now, the apostle John begins to focus down on something here, and that's calling God a liar. That's heavy duty stuff, don't you think? To call him a liar, to call God a liar. And he said, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. So therefore we have to agree, even though we may not understand what the sin may be. That's not the issue. The issue is I agree with God. What does God say about me? Who is he to me? I agree with that. That's good enough. And so the Bible says, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. In 1 John 2, 4, it says, he that saith I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now his commandments and the 10 commandments go together. The 10 commandments is the logos. Is the, uh, is the word of God, the word, the written word, the Ten Commandments. And we find them in the book of Exodus. And so do, does that save us, preacher? No, it's because you have a desire in there to live for the Lord. You want to do what's right. You want to please God. Amen. But you know, you know, you know, that is for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You are not saved by keeping commandments. When you're saved, you want to keep commandments. That's what's important. You have no desire to break God's law, but you're not saved by that law. The Bible said in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22, Who is a liar 
But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Notice how John uses that word antichrist. Antichrist, pseudochristos, false Christ, pseudos. We, we get our word pseudonym from that, a false, a false statement, a false word. And so the pseudochristos, the false Christ, is he, uh, is he here today? The world's grooming him. They're ready for him. But here's the, here's the key. Who is a liar but that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? Not was, will be, is the Christ, which means present tense, the Lord Jesus is alive as the Christ, the Christos, the anointed one of God. You're a liar if you deny that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Christ, the anointed. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Have you ever been around a bunch of people who hate? I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about now just, just anybody in the world. I'm talking about your brothers, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, the ones we have, we, have, we share in a, a common spirit and a common love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I can get along with about anybody if he loves the Lord Jesus. Amen. We may not agree on a lot of doctrine, but if he really loves the Lord Jesus, that's my brother. I can get along with him. And so the Bible says, you're a liar if you hate your brother. And then 1 John 5, 10 says, he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. And he that believeth not God hath made him a liar because he believed not the record that God gave of his Son. The Word of God is important to, to, to the Lord. You're begotten by the Word. Aren't you glad you have the Word? Amen. I am so glad that I've got God's Word. And uh, the Caesar has yet to take it away from us. Now, the first thing the communists do, like Mao Zedong and like uh, uh, Stalin and a lot of them, the first thing they do is take the Word of God away from the people. Why do they do that, preacher? Because they know that when they read that Bible, that Bible shows them a higher authority than them. And it tells them they can be free. Amen. And he can't control the spirit and the soul. He can lock your body up, but he can't lock up your spirit. So they hate the Bible. And they have, they have every reason to. Because we only have one sovereign. And that's the Lord God Almighty. So making him a liar is a big, uh, is a big issue with the Apostle John. John used a couple of words last week. We read them in 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. All right, now look what's happening here. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the elect. So that's quite a thing, don't you think? How many of you caught me now? I hope you're listening. <laughs> the sins of who? The whole world. The whole world. And what is an advocate and what is propitiation? Hilasmos is the Greek word, and it literally means to make an atonement. That's what's happening. In other words, it's to bring two together. It's to come to, it's, it's bringing two together. The, the one who has violated the other must bring a propitiatory offering, all right, to appease God. But you have nothing you can bring to God to appease him, to reduce his wrath, to bring it down. So what happens? God provides his own so that he can propitiate his own appeasement. He provides his son. And all he asks you to do now is to accept what he's done for you. That's the key to our faith, folks. Our faith is not based on who you are and what you can do. Our faith is based on what's already been done. And to trust him, the one who's already done it. And once you've lived long enough to know yourself, you can thank God for grace. I do. Thank God for grace every day. In 1 John 4, 10, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And the word is used again in Romans 3, 25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Here's, the, here's what all that means. It means that God received his own sacrifice that he gave to appease himself, to satisfy his anger. And by doing that, he satisfied his anger against all the sins that had been committed before. See what he said? 
to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. Forbearance means long suffering of God. And so the Old Testament saint could never have peace. He could never have it because the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, but God knew it and held it all in abeyance until Christ died. And when the Lord Jesus died, he died for all the Old Testament saints' sins. And that brought them into the relationship with God where he was, he was satisfied with them. Appeasement, you see, propitiation. And that's what it's all about. God always makes the first move. In our relationship with the Lord, it's not based upon our ability. It's based on what's already been done. He makes the first move. So he's the propitiation. So we have an advocate and propitiation. An advocate is one who is in a court. We've got a lawyer. And the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, is the lawyer of lawyers, the greatest lawyer there ever will be. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 5, the Bible said, And know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now what's going on here? Wait a minute. Am I reading that correctly? Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Well, the Bible said if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. If we say we have not sinned, we call him a liar. Now here's what's happening, folks. The first part of the gospel, or the book of 1 John, lays down the foundation that everything else that happens in that book comes back to that. It's based on it. It cannot contradict it. It can't counter it. It can't do away with it. So it establishes a principle, and that principle is this. You're never sinless. You're never sinless. All it takes is confession on your part to be right with God. And if you say you're sinless, then you make God a liar. So then we take that and we compare it with what we just read. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. But you see that word sinneth means living a life in sin. That's what it means. In other words, it doesn't mean some Christian who by the grace of God is living for the Lord, but he fails and comes up short. This is someone who lives in open rebellion, in rebellion against God and practices a sinful life. And the Bible says if that's the kind of life they live, they don't know God. They've never met him. They've never known him. And so the Apostle John deals with sin like no other book in the New Testament. In fact, there's no book in the Bible. He talks about it more and approaches it from different direction and gives you all the nuances. In other words, the shades of difference application as it relates to sin and God. You just read one here. He just told you. If you can live a life of uh, a life of, a, a, a profligate, a sinner, I'm talking about somebody in rebellion against God, you never seek the face of the Lord, you never confess your sin. The Apostle John says, you don't know the Lord. Never met him. You have any idea who he is? Now, he gives us some birthmarks in 1 John. You say, what's a birthmark? A birthmark is something that lets you know that you belong to someone, that you're born again. And John's talking about the new birth. Here's one, 1 John 2, 29. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Now, John never tells you that you're practicing righteousness. In plainer words, you're living by your righteousness. What John is telling you is the faith you have in Christ produce, produces a righteousness in your life that works itself out before people. That's what he's talking about. And you have people in this world who trust their own righteousness. You see the difference, how closely related they can be? They think, well, I live good. I'm a good person. I don't, I'm not bad to anyone. Surely God wouldn't turn me away. That's your self-righteousness. That's your righteousness. And that will not work. The Apostle Paul not, said, not having my own righteousness, but the righteousness which is by faith in Jesus Christ. If you are truly a born-again believer, righteousness is going to be manifested through your life. But it's the righteousness of the power of the Holy Spirit working through you. Not something you produce yourself. Because we can't produce righteousness. It's, it's, it's wrought by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. God demands of you what he can only give to you and receive from you. It comes from him to begin with. 
That makes us totally and completely dependent upon him for everything he requires of us. And this is why Paul said, what do you have that you did not receive of the Lord? And what do we have? We have nothing. We owe him for everything. 1 John 3, 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, this is one of those passages in the Bible that can be approached a couple of ways. One way is this. The born-again spirit, it is impossible to sin. Okay? The spirit that is born of God is born of the Holy Spirit of God. That spirit cannot sin. But when you look at it from another position, you could simply say, whosoever is born of God does not practice sin, commit sin. You see, because you can't come along and tell somebody that's born again, well, if you sin, you're not saved. You can't tell someone that. You can't tell them that because the Bible says in 1 John 2, if we, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And that's not talking to unsaved people. You see the closeness of how it's dealing with this? It's approaching it from a lot of different directions. And in some cases, it may be what, what you might call lawyers are arguing their case before a judge. This is what's going on here. Because he said we have an advocate with the Father. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. There's another birthmark. Because we love. And you, you find somebody in church that has no love in them, folks. They've never met the one who is love. And the Bible says God is love. 1 John. God is love. I know they wear it out, and I know it can be perverted, and I understand how it's, it's the kind of word, especially in the English language, because we don't, have, we don't use all the, there's about five different words in Greek that are translated love, but in the English language, we only have one word, and it's love, and it gets, all, it gets worked over every day. And the worst case scenario is when you're told to love yourself, and that's awful, but we love our brethren. Then he tells you what that means. We're not going to get into that tonight. But he says, if you really love your brethren, you should be able to lay your life down for them. That's strong stuff. You know, this faith that we have tonight is not a game. It's not some little Mickey Mouse thing picked up in some parlor somewhere. Some passing fad that's here today and gone tomorrow. The faith that we have tonight in our Lord Jesus Christ was born 2,000 years ago at the cross at Calvary. And I thank God that I'm part of that tonight. The Bible says, 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. That's pretty strong, don't you think? It really is. To put it in practical terms, how many men would die for their family because they love their wife and they love their children? If they wouldn't die for them, they're not a man, first of all. And if they wouldn't die for them, they don't love them. They love themselves. They, they, want, to, they, want, to, they want to keep their own life uh, more, than, more than their children, more than their family, more than their wife. You see, we've lost something. Lord, have mercy that ever steals something from this generation. It was stolen from this generation uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago. My, my, my. So sad. It's so sad because so many today have never known the kind of world that this used to be. So the Bible says, For whoso whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is a birthmark. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? That's John talking. John the Son of God. Now notice what he says in 1 John 5. In, in, uh, let me see. Let me get my paper back here before I jump too fast, too far. All right. I want to talk to you tonight about the sin unto death. Okay? It's important to understand the doctrine. Do people die because they sin? Well, here's what the Bible says. In 1 John 5, verse 16, If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. 
All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. All right, let's look at one thing about this that's important. We have a brother that's conscious of the life of another brother, because this is, this is brothers, this is not unsaved people. The only way that you could have any knowledge whatsoever of a Christian sinning a sin unto death is to know that person and to know how they've lived and to see what's come into their life. In other words, there has to be a relationship going on here. That's just Morton. There has to be a relationship. Nobody, nobody can walk into the church house and, and walk into a church house amongst a bunch of people that doesn't know, but he sees somebody, obviously they're not right with God or something. He, he can no, long, no more point his finger at them and say, God's gonna kill you, than he could rise and fly. See what I mean? He doesn't know that person. He knows nothing about them. So what, what's the foundation? What, what's the foundation going on here when it says, if a man see his brother sin, and here it's a participle, sinning, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. In plain words, if you see your brother living a life like any other Christian would live, walking in fellowship, walking in the love of the Lord, but stumbling here and stumbling there. He may fall here, he may fall there, but he comes back, he lives for the Lord. He has weakness in his flesh, he has his problems, but he still comes back. The apostle John, if a brother see a brother do that, that's not a sin unto death. But then he goes on to say, there is a sin unto death, and I do not say that he shall pray for it. Now watch the way he says this. All unrighteousness is sin. All of it. So what's that mean? That means that there is no particular sin named here, nor is, they a, there, nor is there a particular sin that you could commit that would be classified, oh, you committed the sin unto death by committing one sin. No. This is what he's talking about. He's saying that all unrighteousness is sin, right? So the sin unto death is part of all unrighteousness. Are so you following me here now? Okay. The sin unto death is somewhere among those, the sins of all unrighteousness. But you may commit the same sin that someone else commits, and the sin that someone else commits causes their death not because of the sin they've committed, but because of the state they have reached in committing that sin. That's what John's talking about. That's what he's talking about. Unrepentant, rebellion, and whatever, and here's the thing about sin. Sin's a spiritual thing. Spirit's connected with each other. Spirit leaves, man sweeps, swept, garnishes, he comes back, finds his place swept and garnished, but he brings seven more worse than himself. All right? In other words, the sin of lying is connected with the same spirit as murder. There's only one. Only one. Are you following me now? In plain words, if you get on that road where there's no confession and no cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he cleanses our walk daily. That little sin, or however you want to call it, can grow into a much bigger sin. Why? Because it's of the same spirit. All sin is spiritual. And if you, let it, if you don't do something about it when it begins, it can eat you alive. The Bible talks about a root of bitterness. You understand what that means? It means that something has been planted that's going to blossom one day. It's going to grow into something much bigger. It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. But it started as a root of bitterness. Scripture says, give no place to the devil. And I have to deal with that. I don't know about you all, but I have to deal with it. I had, a, I had quite a prayer today dealing with this place. I knew, I knew Satan was trying to enter in through a, th through a gate 
that I was about to allow him to enter in through. Okay? And the gate that I was about to allow him to enter in through had nothing to do with me doing something. It had to do with me not doing something. It had to do with me not giving it into the hands of the Lord and let the Lord cleanse it and allow me to continue to walk in fellowship with him. When you get your feelings hurt, you harbor those feelings. If somebody does you wrong, you can hold grudges against people. If you fail to reach the goals that you set for yourself, it can eat you up. All kinds of things can begin to work on you. And here's the thing, it may not start all that bad, but if you don't take care of it and bring it before the Lord and get it cleansed, it will open the door for something worse that'll grow and grow and grow, a root of bitterness. My. So I got in there on my face before the Lord and I talked to him. And I said, Lord, I can't do anything with this. It's eating me alive. Take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. And when I got up and came out of that room, I felt it lift from my soul. And I was free from it. Now, the devil may bring it back. He may try to beat me over the head with it again. He's the accuser of the brethren. And how many of you are following what I'm saying tonight? Yes, somebody ever, has, has somebody ever done anything to you and it took you a while to get back with God? because you harbored feelings in your soul for that individual. You wanted to get back at him. You wanted to come, you wanted to get back, get back at it. And, uh, and that's, that's natural. But that is a do an open door for Satan because he'll come in. You give, him, you give him half an opportunity and he will come in. So to me, my interpretation of the scripture is that a sin unto death is when a Christian, and this is not an unbeliever, these are Christians, refuses to allow himself to walk in fellowship with God, either harbors something that causes him to open up to something much worse, that puts him on a path to destruction. And James said, sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And it may take you a long time. It may take you years. What started years ago for some people, it is just now beginning to manifest itself. It's beginning to eat you up. The Bible said the word doth eat as a canker. Things take time and they, they grow and they eat and they eat and they eat. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 8, it says, He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Isn't that a wonderful thing? It really is. In 1 John chapter number 3 and verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. So what seed are we talking about? We're talking about the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about. And you cannot live, you cannot live, you cannot live a life in rebellion to God, refusing to get right with God and to make it right with God and bring it under the blood, and if, you've, and if you've studied the Bible any, you understand that you're not forgiven because you want to be forgiven. You're not forgiven because you try to get forgiven. You're not forgiven because you pay something to God to be forgiven. You're not forgiven because you trust in the, in the righteousness of the saints that have gone on before you. You're not forgiven because somebody waves their hand over your head and absolves you of your sins. Why are you forgiven? You're forgiven for his name's sake for what he has done for you based completely on what God did for us. Every, it's all of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord, every bit of it. So our Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior and God will not reject his Son. And therefore, if you trust him, cling to him and plead that blood covenant, Satan cannot cross that line and you will be forgiven. And this is the greatest promise, I think, in the book of 1 John. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Don't ever make the mistake of opening your soul up to a human being. Don't ever do it. 
Don't ever open yourself up and tell all that you've ever done in this world in the past to a human being. Even the greatest of human beings, they can't handle it. They can't handle it. And although they intend to be your friend and pray for you and try to help you, they'll never forget what you told them. And that becomes a weapon that Satan can use to beat you to death with. So who do you confess to? You confess to God. Amen. You notice when that old boy beat his chest and said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. <laughs> he, he could just as easily have looked over at the guy standing, the Pharisee standing in the corner and said, I just stole everything you got. <laughs> well, I don't know what he did, but I know this, he got, he got forgiveness, didn't he? So here's the point. The Pharisee didn't have any clue what kind of a sinner he was. He just knew he was a sinner. That's all he needed to know. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Are you following me on that? I hope so. Father, bless your word now. Thank you for the time we have together. Lord, I do not look into myself for righteousness. I am not righteous. I don't even look to myself for faith. The faith I have is the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't look into myself for anything spiritual. I ask, seek, find, call upon your name to give me everything I need tonight and to cleanse me in the blood of Christ. You said that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I ask you to do that, Lord. I ask you to do it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. I reckon I'm done. Does anybody have a... Remember uh, Brenda Presley? She's got a blood clot. And I don't know if she's still at Fort Sanders Hospital or if she's gone home. Okay. Okay. And so uh, please pray for her, folks. Blood clot. It's, it's my understanding it's in her lung. Okay. All right. And so remember her in prayers. Anybody else have requests tonight? Yes, ma'am. hear that she's already had one husband pass away you know all right please pray for her all right yes ma'am <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Brother John Beck, a good man. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes. Now you said that he fell. He fell a few weeks ago and it's been hurting him quite a bit. And he finally went to the doctor and now he has to go to a surgeon. So they're going to do surgery. Apparently there's a fracture or something. All right. So pray for Brother Tekel. All right. Anybody else? All right. Yes, sir. Yes, amen.
sure you do. Pray works with you like he did with uh, Jacob and Esau. Yeah, Esau thought his days were numbered, but I mean, Jacob thought his days were numbered, found out Esau had completely changed. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, brother. Amen. Okay, anybody else? We we'll have unspoken requests tonight. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother, uh, Brother Howe, will you lead us in prayer, please? Amen. Thank you, brother. Amen. Uh, Saturday at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, they have the fall festival. All, everybody's invited. Bring somebody with you.